and holy palm and passion sunday to all of you well i wish we could gather together it's really an honor and a blessing to be able to use the miracles of modern technology to share this worship with you today's worship will be a full eucharist service that includes some of our favorite hymns that we sing just once a year on this blessed occasion Please be aware that because of the most extraordinary circumstances we are in, the distribution of communion has been completely suspended throughout our church and throughout our diocese. So I will engage in the rather unusual practice of celebrating and receiving communion on behalf of the whole congregation. I'm aware that in the Episcopal Church this is not usually our practice, but these extraordinary times call for somewhat different measures, so please know that I am prayerfully receiving communion on behalf of all of you, and that as our prayer book teaches, the desire to participate and the draw to participate is equivalent to actually participating. So thank you for tuning in to worship this morning and participating in the most meaningful and connected way that we all can. I now invite us all into just a moment of prayerful silence that we might prepare our hearts and our minds to worship our Lord especially on this holy occasion as we commemorate his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and his passion. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace, Peace in, in heaven, heaven and glory in the highest. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. When Jesus and his disciples had come near Jerusalem, and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Savior Jesus Christ to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, that all humankind should follow the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may both follow the example of his patience and also be made partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
This is the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when Jesus was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But Jesus gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to the crowd, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For Pilate realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests and the elders had handed Jesus over. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And the crowd said, Barabbas! Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then Pilate asked, Why, what evil has he done? But the crowd shouted all the more, Let him be crucified! So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped Jesus and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand, and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on Jesus and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, the soldiers came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. And when the soldiers came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over Jesus' head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple, and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking.
mocking Jesus, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if God wants to. For this man said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with Jesus also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lemma, Sabatani. That is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. So friends, I'm going to begin today by talking to you about what I know everyone is just dying to hear about this Sunday. Dirty politics, chaos, and fear. I know that's exactly why you decided to tune in to church today. Now before you cut off this sermon and walk away in disgust, give me just a few minutes. I'm going someplace good with this, I promise. I think there's no question we're surrounded on almost every side by dirty politics, chaos, and fear. First and foremost, there is the simple question of facts. Even with things that really should, by all appearances, be beyond interpretation, simple numbers and statistics, there isn't any widespread agreement. It really depends on which is your new source of choice, what numbers you get. And then, when it comes to interpretation, things are even more disjointed. Even with these differing facts, we get wildly different interpretations. Everybody's telling us one thing or another, and the accusations of opportunism are floating everywhere we look. No one can claim innocence. No one is immune. Everyone is accusing someone else of trying to take advantage of a crisis moment to advance some sort of personal agenda. And finally, there's the psychological and the spiritual climate we find ourselves in. We seem to find ourselves in a world where emotion matters more than logic, and it's the primary tool that's used to attempt to motivate people's behavior. Everybody is told we're supposed to be absolutely terrified. Perhaps even more so, being terrified is the mark of being a good citizen, even though it's never stated entirely clearly what we're supposed to be terrified of 
let alone what, from a calm, rational place, we ought to do about it. Well, friends, I'm here to tell you this is nothing new. Jerusalem in the year 30 AD was just as full of dirty politics, chaos, and fear as our world is right here and right now. Let's think for a moment about the passion story we just read and heard. It's full of it on every side. First, we have to note that the power structure of Jesus' time and place at the moment of his passion was bizarre to put it mildly. There are several players in this dynamic. We have the temple authorities, the religious authorities of the time, the ones that are referred to most often in the narrative as the chief priests. Now this is a group of people that had rather little formal power, but obviously had enough sway to excise a tax out of nearly all worshiping Jews of the region and to have a police force of their own. And then we have the intellectual and the spiritual leaders, the ones that are called the elders, or the scribes, or the Pharisees, ones on whom, if we're honest, Jesus casts aspersions quite often throughout the Gospel. These were a group of people with essentially no form of power, but a great deal of intellectual sway over the minds and the hearts of the population. And then we have the one that by all appearances had a great deal of formal power. Herod, the puppet king, the one who fancied himself as a despot. But overshadowing all of them, we have the shadowy, most often invisible place where the real power lied, the place where even Herod had to cower. And that was in the colonial Roman government. Nobody wanted to speak it out loud. In fact, even entering into his presence or having the immediate dialogue with him being under the same roof with him would render an observant Jew ritually unclean. But everybody knew that the ultimate say in all matters of religion belonged with Pilate. Well, in the middle of this bizarre power structure, the elders chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, all want to see Jesus dead. And if we can be honest for a moment, it's perhaps not for entirely malicious reasons. Jerusalem in the year 30 AD was a tinderbox. It seemed like the slightest thing could result in a conflagration that would consume everyone and everything and destroy the livelihoods of all the residents. And a charismatic leader who refused to follow in lockstep with the Roman colonial authorities was a serious threat to that tenuous order. And so, the obvious solution was to get him out of the way. But how was this to be accomplished? It couldn't be accomplished in any way that was above board. We get from the narrative itself that because of the power structure of the time, no matter how badly they wanted to, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, even Herod himself, had no power to mount a death penalty case against Jesus or anyone. And likewise, Pilate had no interest in doing so for anyone who was not committing outright sedition against Rome. And so the ones who needed Jesus dead had to do so by the most underhanded means possible. They had to send a betrayer from one of, one of Jesus' own ranks into his midst in the middle of the night at a time and place where no one would know what they were up to. And they had to time it exactly right at the beginning of the Passover festival so it would force both the crowd and Pilate into a quick decision driven more by emotion than by fact. And it worked. 
From the time of Jesus' arrest to the time he was hung on the cross, the narrative tells us less than 24 hours passed. And the fickle crowd, the same crowd that a week earlier had yelled, Hosanna in the highest heaven, Hosanna to the Son of David, as Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem, was now calling thirstily for his death. Now, lest we think that this was a phenomenon only of the time past, let's look at the strange parallels between it and our time now. No one was clear on the facts. Everyone's facts were a little different. Everyone's interpretations of the facts were wildly different. Everyone was told that fear was the one and only fitting response to what they were seeing go on in their midst. And above all, it was emotion, more than calm rationality, that was driving anyone and everyone to do what they did. Now, lest you shut off your live feed or your recorded sermon in despair, let me know that far from being bad news, this is actually incredibly good news. And that's because of the one ultimately important thing I haven't yet addressed in this sermon. Let's never forget what was going on that fateful week in Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago from a cosmic point of view. In the midst of all the dirty politics, all the chaos, all the fear, God was performing the miracle miracles. God was delivering not just us, but the entirety of humanity, past, present, and future, from the age-old curse of our self-loathing, self-destructive bents and tendencies. God was nailing to the cross every shortcoming, every source of shame and guilt that humanity can possibly produce. God was telling us in no uncertain terms by sharing in a betrayal and a death like so many humans have to experience that we can stand on the wreckage of history, we can stand on the wreckage of our own lives and raise our hands and our hearts in victory, knowing that no shackle of shame, no shackle of guilt, no shackle past mistakes can hold us down because Jesus took it all on his own shoulders. God did not do that in spite of, but intentionally in the midst of a world of dirty politics, chaos, and fear. Maybe God is just showing off that he can take such a situation and turn it into something glorious, but whatever the motivation, it is an incredible source of comfort and strength. And so, my friends, this Holy Week, this very bizarre and strange Holy Week, one that resembles nothing that any of us have likely ever seen before in our lifetimes, I invite you to ponder anew this miraculous passion story. Read it many times. Let it turn this way and that in your mind. Examine it from every perspective you possibly can. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it. And then, having done that, slowly let your contemplation gaze move from Jerusalem in 30 AD to our own time and place. Again, Look at it from every angle, look at it from every side, in light of the miraculous story of Christ's passion. And as you do, I trust that in your inward soul of souls, you will begin to realize that in spite of all the messages coming our way from every quarter, fear and despair are not the fitting response to what's happening around us. Rather, expectancy is. 
expectancy that just as he did in the year 30 AD, God will, in the midst of all the dirty politics, of all the chaos, of all the fear, perform a miracle that transcends anything we've ever seen. Friends, let's watch and see that happen this very week. of the pastoral history, let us pray, saying, Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, we give you thanks for this holy week in which your church is especially called to remember the mighty acts by which you have opened the doors of God's kingdom to every tribe and nation. Give to your people your strength to endure, and your victory over every enemy, even death. Pour out your blessing upon the church throughout the world that finds its life in your love and mercy. Send this blessing especially today upon the Anglican Communion, including Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the province of the Indian Ocean. Pour out your spirit upon, also upon the Episcopal Church and our diocese, including Michael, our presiding bishop, Mark, our bishop, and Iglesia El Buen Pastor in Gregory City. Let your blessing also come to our fellow faith assemblies especially Celebration Church in Livermore. Lord, have mercy upon us. O God, in whom mercy and justice embrace, we ask for your love to take wings in all the nations and peoples of the world. Bend the hearts of all nations and peoples for peace and righteousness. Send your spirit especially upon Donald, our president, Gavin, our governor, John, our mayor, and all who serve in legislative assemblies or judicial roles in this and every land. Lord, have mercy upon us. O oh, great physician and healer, in this time of the pandemic and all of the fear and uncertainty that surrounds us, it, we lift up to you all those who care for the sick and the suffering. Pour out a special blessing upon all who follow your call to care for others in body, mind, and spirit. Give them the gift of courage and protect them from all adversity and harm. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, this congregation gathers together as a people made clean and whole by your grace and looking eagerly for the consummation of your kingdom. Bless all its members with the gifts of hope, wisdom, and compassion. Pour out a special blessing on these members in our weekly cycle of prayer. Mark and Abigail Clemens, Jessica, Charlotte, and Patrick, Jessica Powers, and Chris Gibson, and Nesta, and Carol herself. Bless all of them. 
as well as those in military service. Aaron Barnes, Valerie Manuel, Amber Rice, Christopher Weaver, and Taylor Williamson. Lord, have mercy upon us. We pray also for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those who have requested our prayers for healing and wholeness. A. Alice, Olivia, Anna, Anna Marie, Ashley, Audrey, Becky, Betty, Diana, Donna, Dorothy, Esteban, Glennis, Janice, Jason, Jerry, John, Justin, Kay, Mark, Marie, Marilyn, Mary Beth, Maureen, Naomi, Robert, Sally, Sharon, Steve, the Graham family, the Wetzel family. Give your people the gifts of comfort and healing, as well as a lively and abiding faith in your goodness throughout all circumstances. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord Christ, in your passion and resurrection, you made death the gateway to new and eternal life. Pour that life upon all your servants departed this life, especially Stephen Weston, Betty John Wood, Mike Weston, Robert Ronald Butcher, and raise them to everlasting glory in your kingdom. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now, O oh Christ, in eager anticipation of your coming kingdom, we pray to you with hearts and voices for our other needs and concerns. And we offer you thanks for all the blessings of this life. Give us grace, O Lord, especially in this time of quarantine, to see your fingerprints everywhere we look, to notice through the fog the pattern of your Son's passion and resurrection in every person we meet and in every event we encounter. We ask this for the sake of your tender love. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. you. Friends, I'm aware that many of you are alone and, and others are only with a very small group of immediate family. And just know that even though we cannot extend one another physical gestures of peace, that uh, the spiritual gift of peace is absolutely given to you from my heart and the hearts of all in this place. And I know the hearts of each and every one in this congregation for one another. We 
please accept the gifts of love and peace that we offer to one another. And now, as we prepare the table for Holy Communion, I invite you to walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For our sins he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore we praise him, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
to reconcile us to you, the God and the Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrifice and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. But thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for Therefore, let us keep the peace. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God, given and received on your behalf. In this Holy Communion, feed on our Lord Jesus Christ in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
In thanksgiving, let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual children of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, Send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and to serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To Him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you this holy day and always. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.